Hello, everyone, and welcome to Metabolomics, Completing the Picture in Systems Biology, presented by Metabolon. I'm Michael Gibney, editor of Fierce Biotech, and I'll be moderating this webinar. Our speaker today is Kirk Beebe, PhD, Director of Application Science at Metabolon, Inc. You can read his full bio on the right side of your window. Just a few technical notes before we begin. If you have trouble reading a slide, please hold and drag the right corner of the slide window to enlarge. Please also disable your pop-up blocker to participate in the interactive parts of this presentation. To download a copy of the slides, please click the Download Slide widget at the bottom of your screen. We will follow the presentations by a Q&A session. Please submit your questions during or after the presentations using the Q&A box at the right of your window. In today's webinar, Kirk is going to discuss some of the challenges faced by systems biology and then introduce you to the concept of metabolomics as a key way to address these challenges. He then will outline and dissect the fundamentals as to why metabolomics is a key way to address these challenges. Finally, he will progressively zoom in on some examples of how metabolomics has been used to solve specific research problems. Okay, now let's begin. Kirk, please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, let me just start off with the, this high-level overview slide where essentially it's, a, it's just a picture of where we're at with, with um, life sciences today, where we've never really had a greater capacity to produce data in terms of its quality and also quantity. And I'm going to focus a little bit in on uh, genomics because it, arguably it really is the focal point of systems biology. And I think the, uh, the graph on the left really captures why, in some ways, the, the capacity and the production of data is so great today with the cost of sequencing going down so, so dramatically. Now being at uh, the so-called, uh, we're at the so-called $1,000 genome level now. So our capacity to produce this data in detail and quantity is great. The challenge ultimately is to how do we connect this to human health? And more specifically, it's how do we take these pieces and all of this data and mechanistically link it to the phenotype. It's really a daunting challenge, and that's going to be a lot of the topic of today's presentation. But if we go back to the um, genomics example here, there, there really is an increasing recognition that orthogonal data is going to be necessary in order to put all these pieces together. And I've captured several quotes by experts in the genomics field here that really express this sentiment, that it's not going to just be one data stream. It's not just going to be um, sequencing a gene and figuring out um, what, what these complex phenotypes are composed of. It's going to take other types of data. And I like to kind of call out this, uh, probably what captures it best, the quote on the second line here from Ron Davis, where basically he says, there's never, um, he never for a moment imagined that DNA alone could reliably predict the development of most diseases. And I think that captures the sentiment of where we're at. And there really are some fundamental reasons. I'm going to spend some time on it in the next slide as to why it's, it's believed now that there needs to be other um, data streams involved. And if we just start very simply here and, and think about these fundamental reasons, in the case where there's a single mutation that's strongly penetrant that explains most of the phenotype, that's great. It's, it's, a, it's a clear case. It's a clear-cut example. And there certainly are a lot of examples of that. But one thing that the genomics field has done the last decade is it's really shown us that the, this is probably likely more the exception than the rule, these straightforward, highly penetrant examples. And then it's probably more likely that um, these traits of biomedical or evolutionary interest are, are more often composed of lifestyle environment as well as this, um, this third rail of the second genome, essentially, the microbiome, and that most of these traits genetically are polygenic. That is, they're composed of uh, multiple alleles um, driving a particular phenotype. And kind of zeroing in on the complexity at the genetic level, the other thing to consider in what genomics has taught us the last decade is that the majority of mutations of interest appear to be in non-coding regions, so they're, it's going to be extremely challenging to understand what these mean functionally. Um, there's a lot more genetic diversity or allelic variability within humans, so being able to look at all these subtle mutations and understand um, which of those low-frequency mutations are important mechanistically is going to be uh, a challenge. Uh, 
you know, just another point that's important to consider when you think about genetics is it is going to be static. That is, it's going to be uh, valuable for predicting risk, but it's not going to be, it's going to have limitations in being able to predict and understand response. And then I think the last point as to why there are a lot of challenges here still with thinking about it from a purely genetic basis is it's still far from trivial from a technical perspective in terms of being able to sequence an entire genome despite the cost, being able to do that with high fidelity such that you can actually make some sort of a meaningful assessment about the phenotype and then, of course, make meaningful assessments about the clinical, uh, um, you know, uh, clinical decisions as well. So um, I'm certainly not, I'm not advocating that we don't embrace and pursue understanding of the genetics, but I think we, there is a clear need for orthogonal data streams. And it's really just a question of which orthogonal data streams do we add? And of course, in a perfect world, we'd add all of these, we'd, we'd uh, combine that, but you do have to prioritize at times. There are practical limitations. And I think that um, one of the, one of, a nice source for um, looking at this and trying to prioritize is actually an issue of nature that came out, I think, last year, where they essentially, and the whole issue featured omics, or um, different, uh, different ohms, and assessed whether they were you know, good, bad, or ugly, so to speak. And, um, the, uh, you know, and also assessed whether they were the established ones, emerging, and, or aspiring. And the established ones, under the established ones, of course you see genomics, transcriptomics, and, and proteomics, but also the topic of today's presentation, which is the, the metabolome, which is all the small molecules of a particular system. And I'm going to focus a lot of the next few slides on why that's a particularly useful data stream in trying to understand the complexity of of human phenotypes and bring system biology together. But first I want to just give a brief orientation and make sure we're all on the same page about what I'm talking about with the metabolome. Yes, um, it's all the small molecules, as mentioned, that Nature article, metabolites of a system, so these classic molecules of biochemistry, and the metabolome is just the, uh, you know, the, the entirety of that. Now, the tool for assessing that or measuring the entire metabolome or all the small molecule metabolites is metabolomics. And I'm going to warn you, I'm going to interchangeably use the term metabolome, metabolites, metabolism, and metabolomics to really just reflect those small molecules and how they relate to the biology of the system. Um, so just do, be forewarned as I go, out, go throughout these slides, I'm going to use them interchangeably. But really, all they are is the end product of the central dogma of genes to transcript to proteins. And, they, and a couple important traits to mention here, because they're going to be reflected throughout the slides, um, and one of them is that metabolites are very close to the phenotype, not just in the schematic drawing, but functionally they are. They're, they really are a, a surrogate of the phenotype. So if you're trying to understand the phenotype, they're quite valuable in that regard. The other thing is that in terms of complexity, they actually are a reduced data set in a sense that the, uh, they're, they're at least an order of magnitude, uh, fewer measurements that you would make in the metabolome than you would in the genome, transcriptome, and proteome. You're talking about a, um, a data set that's on the order of 10 to the third. So it's actually fairly tractable to understand what this data means. So uh, those are kind of the more practical attributes. What I want to get into now is um, why this is, I'm going to dissect why this is particularly valuable to study metabolites, metabolomics, metabolism. And um, it really starts with the fact that it has really deep roots in biology. And that's kind of depicted on the next slide where metabolomics, ultimately, the fundamentals are buried deep within biochemistry. And biochemistry is, is uh, if you remember back to your undergraduate biochemistry textbook, the middle section, all those pathways that were either, you were either embraced or perhaps were tormented by. Um, but basically, all these pathways were mapped out by these great biochemists a long time ago, um, Corey, Warburg, Krebs, Meyerhoff. But the important point about these pathways, and it's a really critical point, is in mapping out these pathways, they were simultaneously understanding complex physiological states like muscle metabolism, cancer biology, uh, metabolic diseases like diabetes. So th this mapping allowed them to connect to complex physiologies. And if you think about 
fundamentally why there was success in mapping those pathways and understanding complex biology. It's really because metabolism is life's core unit. It's what it's, it's really the simplified unit that all life evolved around, is organized around, and strives to maintain. So it's perhaps not surprising that you have a tight coupling and interaction between metabolism and signaling genetic regulation, protein regulation. So the next few slides, I'm really going to zero in on these last points about how metabolism is really tightly connected to contemporary biology, the things we're familiar with today, um, such as signaling and, and um, genetic regulation. The first, first slide here just highlights it's a cartoon showing how there are many uh, metabolites that are involved in gene and protein regulation, whether that's methylation, demethylation, acetylation, phosphorylation. These metabolites actually um, control and dictate gene function, um, expression, and also protein uh, function. And it's done so in a very logical way. This is not just a random process, and I think that is um, illustrated nicely on the next slide where I've called out some very familiar molecules um, that are heavily involved in signaling cell cycle, uh, the cell cycle and growth, things like um, mTOR, AMPK, PI3 kinase, molecules that we all appreciate are involved in fundamental cell biological processes, but they also are core metabolic enzymes. In fact, what's important to think about is these particular enzymes, they actually, in controlling these complex processes such as cell cycle and growth and signaling, they do that through metabolic regulation. So it's this tight coupling between these two. And, and, and finally, just, just as another point here, even something as fundamental as the cell cycle regulator P53, it's now well appreciated that it um, has a strong role in um, regulating, meta regulating metabolism. So all of these contemporary units we're familiar with with signaling and basic cell biological properties are tightly connected to metabolism. And the last point, um, I'd like to make, and I could do this for a number of examples, is that almost all complex physiological processes have to engage metabolism. This is actually a um, cartoon taken from, a, uh, from uh, a nature preview from a primary article in Cell last year that actually showed how a single metabolic enzyme, in this case um, PFK2, it actually will, within endothelial cells, promote uh, promote sprouting and therefore an angiogenesis. So this very complex, elegant cell biological process, metabolism plays a key role in. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Almost all processes you can think about have a metabolic role. And if you think about this, this makes perfect sense. If a cell is going to divide, grow, change shape, move, build macromolecules, it has to engage metabolism in a coordinated way with signaling, and it has to do so vigorously. So this, this all makes perfect sense. Um, so that, the last two slides, I really just summarized the central dogma and how it relates to metabolism. I just want to come back to a reminder that we're also dealing with um, the complexity of environmental influences and, and, of course, this, this so-called second genome, the microbiome, and we have to account for that as well when we're trying to understand the phenotype. And I think that's arguably where um, metabolism or metabolomics has um, an even higher amount of value. Um, and it, in effect, the way it's often thought about is that it's really a systems-level diagnostic that's a, that ultimately is agnostic <coughs> to whether the the drivers of a particular phenotype come from the lifestyle and environment, uh, genetics, or the microbiota, so, or, or perhaps a complex combination of those things. So whatever the drivers are, basically um, our phenotypes uh, are, are maintained tightly by metabolic homeostasis. And when you have a disruption in the phenotype or metabolic homeostasis, there's a one-to-one -one relationship there. And I think in order to appreciate this point a little bit more, it's helpful perhaps to kind of go back about 100 years um, to um, some work that the English physician Archibald Garrod did 
where he was studying the, the chemical output of some of his patients. Actually, he was looking at urine, and he was essentially looking at the metabolism in the urine, chemical output. And he found that it was tightly associated with certain clinical states. And he published a paper in 1909 describing inborn errors in metabolism. And that's really the fundamental basis of newborn screening that we do today. So if you think about it, what's going on today when a, new, when a, um, a child is born and you get a heel prick, they're looking at blood metabolites to inform about a particular clinical state or impending clinical state. And in many instances, this is pointing back to mutations in genes, too. So that's why this is often referred to as an intermediate phenotype, metabolites or metabolism as an intermediate phenotype. And this has been, uh, interestingly, this, this 1909 paper and the, the lessons from it have been um, validated in a more modern sense just a couple of years ago in a paper published in Nature, where essentially these modern technologies, genomics and metabolomics, were combined. And it really did demonstrate what a lot of what I've just told you, that metabolomics actually strengthened the assessment of the phenotypic states as well as what the, the gene functions were in these associations. So this kind of concept of it being an intermediate phenotype or diagnostic system was really bolstered in this type of work. And um, the last slide I'm going to show you before we really get into some examples of how this has been used is just a kind of an intuitive slide that all the stuff I've just told, uh, I've just discussed, really we've, we've intuitively been known and we've been using and that there's been a really long-standing long um, utility of metabolites from on the left here, medieval times when the properties of urines were assessed for patients on through standard clinical uh, chemistry and inborn urine testing, which I mentioned earlier, to now more advanced diagnostic tests or LDTs um, and then um, metabolomics. And the thing about the what I've got labeled here over on the far right with kind of 21st century and metabolomics and individual diagnostics is now with these technologies, we have a way to more deeply assess the metabolome and essentially understand disease more precisely, um, response to drugs more precisely, and find more sensitive and specific biomarkers with this technology. So that's, you know, that's the basic framework and rationale for why metabolomics is a, or the study of metabolism is really valuable in, in being able to bridge a lot of this understanding with systems biology. Um, it really has played out in a number of different research areas, and I'm gonna, I want to focus in on a few key examples on the next few slides. But really, you just need not go far in terms of a PubMed search to find a lot of examples where this type of approach is impacting, it doesn't really matter the area of biology or the question. It has a high lo level of value in cementing our understanding of these systems. So I'm going to actually focus in on a few examples that are listed in here um, just to show you how people have used the technology um, to understand some of these complex phenotypes. And I think I, this is one of the examples I, I like to point to um, as really a, a shining illustration of how even though we've been able to tackle things and understand things from a cell biological or molecular biology perspective, we still haven't learned everything. So this is in sickle cell disease. And I'm not going to go into the details of that disease, but suffice it to say, it's, it's caused by a single point mutation in hemoglobin. And what's interesting is this single defect, an amino, the amino acid defect that actually causes this disease was discovered in 1959 by Vernon Ingram. So we basically understood, and um, let me step back. The, the other important point about that discovery is it really did initiate the way we tackle science and medicine today. That is, we like to dissect and understand very precisely what the defects are molecularly and then target those appropriately. But despite knowing where that defect was in 1959, it's been over 50 years of research, and there's still really um, a dearth of treatment options for this disease. So in this particular study, an animal model, a transgenic sickle cell model was used compared to wild type, and a metabolomic screen was done on the blood. And the 
basic finding was that there with, within the blood there were high levels of adenosine. And with that particular clue, that could be that it's a strong biomarker or that it actually is mechanistically linked to the disease. But what they did is they tested the hypothesis to see if it was mechanistically linked. And what they're able to show over in the far right is that when you treat the animals with a drug that can clear adenosine, in this case PEG-ADA, um, you can reduce the levels of adenosine in that sickle cell transgenic animal. And what was important about that is they could then also examine the, the disease phenotype. And it, all the details are in the paper, but it cleared the majority of symptoms from that, from that disease model animal. So basically by clearing the levels of adenosine, it clarified, it cleared up the disease phenotype. And the other important thing is they were able to take this clue of high adenosine levels and the fact that it affected the disease and find that it actually was potentiated through a single G protein coupled receptor, an adenosine receptor. So from that one study, they were able to find a novel therapeutic target and biomarker and really under, improve the kind of understanding of the physiology of sickle cell disease. And if you look in this green box I have on the right, there's a lot of detail on this slide, but essentially the green box highlights what they discovered. The, the blue circle, that adenosine was important, that it actually signaled through a single receptor to ultimately produce another metabolite called 2,3-diphosphoglycerate which caused hemoglobin to dump oxygen more readily, which is, a, it's, which is a natural and elegantly designed adaptation for those of us who don't have that mutation, who might be hiking at high altitudes and need that response, but it's a bad thing for sickle cell patients because the deoxygenated form is the form that tends to polymerize. So um, the, um, the paper was published in Nature Medicine by University of Texas Health Sciences Center and, and uh, and collaborators at Metabolon. And I think the big take home I really like to uh, make with this particular example is that despite you know, elegant understanding, very precise understanding, this, this arguably is one of the most well-studied systems, you still can learn more using this, this technology. Um, another really nice example, and again, of a really challenging problem is finding a mechanism of action of a drug. And so whether it's a drug found from a phenotypic screen or a natural product, oftentimes it's really challenging to find out what precisely is the target it's hitting. So this was actually a compound, GMX 1778, um, that had broad spectrum anti-tumor activity in, in vivo and in vitro. And the mechanism became uncertain. It was thought possibly to involve NF-kappa-B transcriptional activity, but um, that uh, during clinical development, it, it it was called into question. So they did a very simple experiment. They just dosed cells with the drug or DMSO and did a metabolomic screening on the cell pellets to reveal what were the metabolic differences between the vehicle and the drug-treated group. And this is just a snapshot of a lot of the data that was produced, but essentially when you analyze all the data it tr and triangulate all the metabolic changes. It pointed very specifically to one given pathway. It basically suggested that the drug was hitting some sort of uh, enzyme within the, uh, p within the pathways that maintain NAD pools, either the, the pathway that uses nicotinic acid to make NAD or the pathway in kind of in the yellow um, panel here that uses nicotinamide. And essentially what they went on to do is they were able to pretty simply validate that it was indeed hitting the, this enzyme in the yellow box called nicotinamide phosphoribosyl transferase. And I'll show you one key experiment on the next slide. A really simple experiment they were able to do right after they got that hypothesis was they were able to say, well, we have all these in vitro assays set up. Let's see if we can rescue the cells with either nicotinic acid or nicotinamide. You could see that the cells were rescued uh, very effectively with nicotinic acid, and only at really high uh, physiologically irrelevant concentrations did nicotinamide offer rescue. Through a series of other experiments, it's all in the publication, they were able to validate that it actually, the drug actually hit this particular target. So really, in effect, by finding the mechanism of action, identifying the MOA of that drug, they also, in effect, just found a new target. And there are many, uh, several companies that are now pursuing that target 
combining with genomics and clinical data to figure out the best way to use uh, or exploit that target. So it's a really nice example of the joint effectiveness of um, using metabolomics, genomics, clinical data. Um, the other thing that really the main take home here is that this is just a, a great example of how using this tool can take on some of the more, even more challenging kind of quote, needle and haystack problems. And this was published by Geminex Pharmaceuticals and collaborators at Metabolon um, in the Molecular and Cellular Biology, and there's a lot more detail um, within that paper. And the last example I'm going to quickly run you through is another really cryptic, challenging area of research, which is microbiota research. And for those of you following this area, one thing that's certain is there's a lot of studies that are successfully identifying the residents, essentially the composition of the microbiota that are, that are associating with certain phenotypes, but the ability to um, understand what those residents are doing, what, you know, what their actions are. In other words, mechanistically, is, is really, there's a need to start to expand those studies in that direction. And this cartoon I have here is fairly detailed, but I've highlighted in red here all the areas that small molecules or metabolism have an interplay between the microbiota and the, and the host or the, you know, and, and, the, and the associated phenotype. So this was a really interesting study looking at a behavioral phenotype. Uh, it was using an autism model in mice. And essentially, what they found using this, uh, this autism model is that a behavioral phenotype, if you look over here on the right, in the panel on the right, um, the, uh, the model induced a behavioral phenotype shown here going from the control to the, to the, uh, the white panel. But then when treated with a probiotic, shown in blue here, it restored the phenotype. So in essence, this model was working, it induced a behavioral phenotype, and a probiotic could correct it. So the question really was, well, what's the underlying mechanism, and, and might it actually involve um, the output of the microbiome um, in terms of metabolite, metabolites? And just a quick summary of the, of the key results here are that they used this mouse model, they treated with probiotic, and they screened by metabolomics. And in the second panel, what you can see is that in the autism model mouse in the middle, uh, the white box here, that there are very high levels of 4-ethylphenyl sulfate, a metabolite whose genesis is from the microbiota. And as may be expected, it actually cleared, um, these levels of 4-ethylphenyl sulfate were cleared, shown in the blue box, in the treated animals with the probiotic. But the really important experiment to me is shown in the far right, that you could actually take wild-type mice, treat them in red here with four, in the red box here, four ethylphenyl sulfate, and you could induce that same behavioral phenotype. So really, in the end, um, that result showed that a single metabolite could potentiate a complex behavioral phenotype, um, in this case, symptoms associated with autism. And in, in doing so, it essentially provided uh, more specific targets and biomarkers that could potentially be pursued in, um, in the autism research. And the last point here on this slide is that, you know, it's really the bigger point here is that metabolites are something that really need to be considered um, more frequently in studies of microbiota because they're likely a key component in this complex interaction between the host and, um, and the uh, microbiota. And this was published uh, by researchers at Caltech um, in Cell just a few months ago. And with that, I'm just going to summarize uh, with a couple of slides and take some questions, but <clears throat> the main thing, uh, hopefully, you uh, we're able to uh, you know, gain an, an appreciation for is that this is really a key systems biology tool, and it's due to its fundamental properties, things that we discussed in detail in this presentation, the fact that metabolites are really kind of a surrogate for the phenotype, an intermediate phenotype, diagnostic to the phenotype. The fact that part of that reason is they're the foundation, really, of all biological systems. And the other really important feature is that they offer a summation of some of these key drivers of phenotype, whether it's genetics, microbiome, and environment. And since they actually are the foundation of all biological systems, it's not surprising that they also are heavily involved in regulating genes 
proteins and signaling. And one last point I didn't get into a lot in this presentation is that because they are foundational, it's not surprising that they very effectively translate across species. And just a real quick note on the tools that were used in this type of work and the approach that we typically take in this type of research. All of the work I showed you today was, was done on this discovery platform, which is a wide screening platform, essentially a metabolomic platform, to look for those little hits kind of shown in, in, uh, in the red circle on the far left uh, under the discovery platform. And then we typically will move these into more focused panels or targeted assays to confirm or validate. And that type of approach was taken in all the work that I cited today as well. And then finally, this, you know, these biomarkers that come out of these studies can often be turned into routine diagnostic tests as well, as, as we've done at, at, uh, at Metabolon. I mean, you can imagine in this particular, the examples I cited today, um, adenosine uh, with sickle cell disease, 4-ethylphenyl sulfate with autism, um, or even the, the biomarkers associated with nicotinamide metabolism could be turned into biomarkers, if so desired. And with that, um, I thank you a lot for uh, sharing your time with me in this, in, in this kind of enthusiastic area of research that I, I, I really enjoy. And um, happy to take any questions and turn it back to you, Michael. Thank you, Kirk. Now let's move on to Q&A. We have lots of great questions, and we will try to get to as many as possible. Um, the first question, to what extent can, meta can metabolomics be effectively utilized for biomarker discovery and treatment effects for cardiovascular diseases? Oh, so gosh, I hope I, I made that point in this presentation that it's very general to any kind of physiological state. It doesn't really matter. Um, and I, I can say specifically, if you go back to that previous slide with the three blocks of discovery platform, focus panels, and diagnostics, um, even just here at, Met at Metabolon, we've actually developed a, uh, a test that's a insulin resistance test. And of course, that's, of course, going to play an important role in, uh, in cardiovascular diseases as well. I hope you. I conveyed that it's a very general tool. Thank you, Kirk. That is uh, all the time we have. Um, so thank you for attending this fierce live webinar and submitting so many great questions. I'd like to thank Kirk for participating and Metabolon for presenting today's webinar. This webinar has been recorded. You will be able to access the recording within 24 hours on the same page you used to register for this event. Thank you again for joining, and we will look forward to seeing you at future events.